Uh, last week, we went into uh, the invocation of Nam Myoho Renge Horengekyo quite deeply. And I hope those of you who were at that lecture uh, gained some idea of the workings of this invocation, which is the fundamental practice of this Buddhism. And uh, that is also known, the invocation of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is known as the first great secret law. Secret in that it was known only to the Buddhas until it was revealed to everybody by Nichiren Daishonin when he declares Nam Myoho Renge Kyo on the 28th of April, 1253. So today we're going to talk about the second of those three great secret laws, which is the object of devotion, or Gohonzon. Gohonzon. There is a third great secret law, which we shan't be dealing with in any lecture, which is known in Japanese uh, by the word Kaidan. Kaidan meaning sanctuary. The sanctuary in which the object of devotion is enshrined. And those three great secret laws, as they're known, make up the one great law of the lotus, nam myoho renge So uh, today, as I say, we're going to take, talk about the second law, which is the object of devotion itself. So if you think about those three great secret laws, they have a complete cohesion. That is to say, you chant nam myoho renge kyo to the object of devotion, which is the second of the laws, in the sanctuary. So, the gohonzon is available to all of us. Anyone who practices this Buddhism, uh, provided they are willing to make the commitment of protecting and practicing to the gohonzon, may receive one. In which case, of course, one's own bed sitter or one's own sitting room or wherever becomes the kaidan or sanctuary so far as Agahonsen is concerned. This is like the center point of one's devotions and is known as the Buddha's land. And the Buddha's land, because of one's devotions, spreads further and further outwards from that main sanctuary. So there is a complete cohesion between the three laws which make up the one law of Nam so, Myoho Get on to talk about the Gohonzon in some detail. Uh, in the early days of Nichiren Daishonin's teachings, after he declared Nam Myoho in 1253, people practiced without the Gohonzon. And the reason for this uh, was that, of course, they were at the very beginnings of their understanding of this faith. Today, we may practice for three months, or six months, or nine months, or however long it may take us to make up our minds to commit ourselves to Buddhism. And receiving the Gohonzon is like that commitment. But of course, today also, we have uh, an amazing amount of facilities available to us to help us to understand Buddhism, which were not available to people in those days. We have books of many different sorts. There are many members who've practiced for far longer than we may have done, and so on and so on. So therefore, uh, the teachings can be made available very much more easily. Also, of course, there are communications today which didn't exist in the 13th century. And perhaps most important of all, just as the Buddha said, people have the, are more and more having the intellectual capacity to see the need for Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and to place it in its right, right context in this universe in which we exist. So after some long time, Nichiren Daishonin then began to give a few Gohonzons, objects of devotion, to certain of his followers who are advancing the best in faith. In other words, 
who would be able to appreciate the need to have a Gahamsen in order to help them with their practice and with the advance of the reformation of their, their lives which the practice involves. And these Gahamsens were developed more and more, still comparatively few in number, until finally in 1279, on the 12th of October, Nichiren Daishonin inscribed what is known as the Dai Gahonzun, the Supreme Gahonzun. So this was a gradual progression, and the inscription of the Dai Gahonzun by Nichiren Daishonin was really the culmination of his purpose in life, his mission, if you like. Because through the inscription of the Dai Gahonzun, he was able to perpetuate this Buddhism into the future after he died. The reasons for that I'll explain a little so a later. So Gohonzon is in fact uh, a piece of parchment paper or it can be made of wood. And it is the central object of our practice and can hang with ease in any sort of room. Therefore easily available to everybody. Those that are made of parchment are nowadays printed. When they make the gonzen from wood, this is a process which is quite, uh, always kept quite secret, but this is the process where they take the inscription from, transfer it from the original parchment onto a piece of camphor wood. Camphor wood being uh, most resistant to attacks from insects. And usually, where a gonzon uh, is of such a nature that it's going to be used by a great many people, i.e. in a temple or a community center, they will make that wood block, the actual wood block, immediately after the parchment has been inscribed. And that is then kept until the parchment gonzon wears out, which it naturally does, in the end, and then it is replaced by the wooden one. So that's just a few bare facts to begin with for those of you who have not so far really encountered or known much about what a gonzon is. So I should now go on to explain to you as best I can why a gonzon is necessary. Why is it that an object of devotion is important to this practice? And indeed, as Nichiren Daishonin explained, is important for a human being in any case. So, first of all, the word Gohonzon, Go is an honorific title in Japanese, like saying the honorable, say, and Honzon means object of devotion. So, Gohonzon means the honorable object of devotion. Japanese people make it even more polite because they say usually Gohonzon Sama, which means Mr. the Honorable Object of Devotion. Um, Nichiren Daishonin, in one of his most important writings, called the Gohonzon, the object of devotion, Kanjin no Honzon Sho. Kanjin no Honzon Sho. Which means the object of devotion for observing one's mind or life. And that actually sums up what the purpose of this Gohonzon is. It is the object of devotion by means of which you can observe your life and all its workings. So, it was Nichiren Daishonin's wisdom which brought him to the point where he realized that a human being needs an object of devotion. And furthermore, if you don't give a human being an object of devotion, he'll make one up for himself. So we can see that in many instances. Of course, we can see it actually, those of us who uh, practice Christianity or have practiced Christianity, in, in the history of the Christian church. It was one of the great commandments that no graven image would be made of God. But on the other hand, human beings down the centuries couldn't resist making some sort of image. So they made an image 
perhaps of Mary, Jesus' mother, or of the cross, or of Christ actually on the cross. There was a need or a desire to concentrate one's life on something. And this is a natural human instinct which Nichiren Daishonin quite well understood. So, Shakyamuni Buddha, who was the first recorded Buddha in the history of this world, and lived as, you know, 3,000 years and more ago, he also said, do not worship me, worship the law, or words to that effect. But nevertheless, down through the ages, from his time, human beings again couldn't resist this desire to make something concrete to concentrate their minds on. So all over the Far East, one finds statues of the Buddha, lying down, resting, meditating, laughing, in all sorts of different positions. Some are made of gold, some are turquoise, some studded with precious jewels, are made of marble and so on. So there is, you can't get away from it, an innate desire in a human being to have an object of devotion. And most religions, in one way or another, have reached that conclusion that an object of devotion is necessary. Of course, in the primitive religions, tribal religions, this was very obvious. They made totem poles, strange-looking statues in wood, and so on. So it is man's need, and as I say, if he doesn't find one through the wisdom of someone else, he'll make one up. So if you look now at this materialistic age, which began perhaps, you could say, 250 to 300 years ago, as man became disillusioned to a great extent with the religions of the day of our contemporary times, he turned his attention to other forms of objects of devotion. It may have been money, it may have been sport, it may have been girlfriends, it may have been a pet dog, but one way or another they always struggled to concentrate their lives on something. And of course the trouble with these objects of devotion in this materialistic age is that they're most impermanent, aren't they? If you make your girlfriend your object of devotion and you adore her unceasingly for a year or even two years, you never know quite what's going to happen next. She may meet someone else, she may become sick, she may have an accident. So many things can happen to make that object of devotion shake and even disappear. People behave in amazing ways with their objects of devotion. And I never fail to, to uh, remember when I give this lecture that when I first gave a lecture on the Gohonsen, which was in Japan quite a few years ago, just that very day there'd been an article in the Japanese newspapers about a businessman whose passion was golf. And he'd been playing golf uh, in Brazil. And his golf ball went onto a tee and disappeared into the bushes, the other side. And when he went to fetch it, he couldn't find it. And he realized from some giggling that a small boy had taken it. And as he walked towards him, the boy ran away. And this man pulled a pistol out of his pocket and shot him. Now, that, I mean, is utterly insane and almost in a terrible way laughable. But the fact is that that man's object of devotion was his game of golf. His life was totally taken up by it. And I dare say, when you think about it, you perhaps know people whose lives are totally taken up in some way with perhaps a sport. It affects every moment of their lives. They think of it all through the week. If possible, 
They try to make their business appointments around games of golf. It takes precedence often over their families and totally absorbs their life until something changes. Maybe they get a bit too old for it. Or maybe for some reason known only to themselves, their passion turns from golf to a girlfriend or to sports cars or whatever. But this is, this is innate in human life. Mankind needs an object of devotion and goes to an extreme extent to invent one for himself and then is quite absorbed by that devotion until something changes. So Nietzsche and Daishonin recognize this and in inscribing the Gohonzon his determination was to give people an object of devotion that was absolute. Absolute and unchanging. Constant. In other words, an object of devotion that could become the prime point of any human being's life and which would never change, would always be there, always constant, constant in its meaning, constant in its appearance. Something which, if you devote your life to it, will never let you down, never become sick. Something that you can never get tired of because the depth of the meaning of it is so all-embracing. Now this is what he set out to do when he inscribed this piece of parchment called the Gohonson. So another point I ought to mention here is that the way you react to an object of devotion depends on its form and if it's made by man it depends on the state of life of the person who makes it or creates it. So to give an example of this you could take a painting by an artist if an artist is angry when he paints, if he's a person who is seething with frustrated anger, perhaps at the state of the world, he will produce a picture that makes us either angry or frightened. That's presuming, of course, he's a great artist. If a sculptor is hammering out something from stone, what he produces will reflect his state of life. If he is in a mood of rapture, as he does it, this statue will convey that mood. If he's in an unbelievable state of peace and tranquility, the same thing will happen. His work of art, or what he creates, will reflect the state of life that he's in exactly. So we talked about the ten worlds in the first lecture, the ten basic states of life. These states of life, such as hell, hunger, anger, and so on, can all be conveyed through the creativity of the person in that state. So for instance, even the statue of the Buddha, if it's in gold, could reflect perhaps, the world of hunger. The world of desiring things. A statue of the Buddha reclining can probably reflect tranquility. Likewise, if you look at a picture or at a statue of Christ on the cross, it probably will reflect guilt. This will depend, of course, on the state of life of the person who makes that object. So Nichiren Daishonin's purpose, his prime purpose, was pro to produce an object of devotion which reflected his Buddha state, the state of Buddhahood which he had achieved, so that anyone looking at it 
would find that it would gradually bring, bring out the Buddha state in them. This is the purpose of the Gonzi, to bring the Buddha state into the foremost position in our lives through devoting ourselves or practicing to or looking at the Gons in which Nichiren Daishon in him has himself inscribed. So when he inscribed the Gons and he said, I am inscribing my life in Sumi ink, which was the ink they used in Japan to do their calligraphy, so that you can believe with your whole heart. I am inscribing my life so that you can believe with your whole heart. He inscribed in the Buddha state himself, his life, so that we can draw that same state out of our own lives. So you may say, how can a piece of paper do such a thing? After all, it's a piece of paper and it's covered with a lot of Chinese characters. How can it possibly draw anything out of me? But the fact is that pieces of paper can draw incredible things out of one, can't they? We've already mentioned a picture by an artist which can draw anger or rapture or whatever mood you can think of out of people. A pound note brings something out of us, doesn't it? It's still a piece of paper. If we walk around a corner and pick up a 20 pound note, it draws something even more fantastic out of us. But it's still a piece of paper. If we get a letter from our girlfriend and it contains marvelous, romantic, exciting language just as we'd hoped for, it draws fantastic rapture out of us. But if she says, I'm finished with you, you're a so-and-so, it can put us straight into hell. So a piece of paper is incredibly powerful. It reflects the life state of the person who creates it. And Nichiren Daishonin, when he inscribed the Gahonzan, was in the Buddha state. And therefore, it reflects the Buddha state to anyone who devotes themselves to it. And each high priest, down through the ages, has inherited not only that right, but that ability to inscribe a Gohonzon in the Buddha state so that it draws the Buddha state out of us. So you may say, how do I know the high priest was in the Buddha state when he did it? The answer is, of course, you get the actual proof. The Gohonzons never fail. And from the very moment you start to practice to a Gohonzon, you begin to see the change in your life. So in order to decide on how he was going to produce this object of devotion, Nichiren Daishonin, of course, had spent many years studying all the Buddhist teachings that he could lay his hands on in Japan. And as I explained in a previous lecture, in the process of doing that, he realized totally in his life uh, that the Lotus Sutra was supreme just as Shakyamuni himself, who had taught the Lotus Sutra, had stated at that time. So Nichiren Daishonin took the Gohonzon, as it were, out of the manuscript of the Lotus Sutra. And in that way, he was able to substantiate the flow of Buddhism down through in the ages from Shakyamuni to himself. So in the Lotus Sutra, there is a chapter in which uh, an extraordinary ceremony is described. It's known as the Ceremony of the Air. A-I-R, not H-E-I-R. The Ceremony of the Air. And in this ceremony, which I'm not going to go into in detail now, but in this ceremony, an incredible great treasure tower appeared. This treasure tower, as it's called, was vast and it was encrusted with jewels and gems and was the most beautiful object you can imagine. And after 
uh, some time as this ceremony developed, it was seen that there was a Buddha sitting in the center of this treasure tower. This Buddha's name is Taho, T-A-H-O, and he is a legendary Buddha, a Buddha whose name represents one of the great principles of Buddhism, which again I'll come to in a moment. And after a little while, Shakyamuni was there sitting beside him. And finally, four great bodhisattvas appeared and presented themselves to these two Buddhas sitting in this treasure tower. And furthermore, countless other bodhisattvas rose up out of the earth and assembled in masses and masses round this great treasure tower. So this was a figurative means which Shakyamuni used in order to explain the flow of Buddhism into the future. Shakyamuni Buddha, in that treasure tower, represented the wisdom, the subjective wisdom that exists in every one of us, the wisdom arising from the Buddha's state. And Taho Buddha represents the good fortune that people can draw into their lives from outside them through the qualities of wisdom and compassion in the Buddha state. And those four great bodhisattvas that came and presented themselves in front of the treasure tower represent the most wonderful qualities which each human being innately has in his or her life. So the people who arose out of the earth around are you and I, or the bodhisattvas of the earth who inherit Buddhism and chant nam myoho renge kyo if you decide to do so. So the meaning of this story is that Shakyamuni and Taho, the two Buddhas who were in that treasure tower, representing all the great greatness of the Buddha state, the Buddha state which exists in every, every human being, the wisdom on the one side and the ability to draw good fortune to your life through elevating the Buddha state in you, were joined by the, the four great bodhisattvas who were the leaders of all these bodhisattvas of the earth. And in the process of the ceremony, they transferred the heritage to the greatest of those leaders, whose name was Jogyo. So Jogyo, the leader of the bodhisattvas of the earth, inherited the law which the treasure tower represented, the law of nam myoho renge kyo And it was the task of all those bodhisattvas, greater, the sutra says, than all the sands of 10,000 Ganges rivers, or words to that effect, were the people who in due course of time in the age of Mapo, which is the age that began around 900 or 1000 AD, would inherit this law, passing it on to each other one by one. So I wanted to just explain that to you because that is, as it were, the historical background to the design of the Gongsun. It lives, in other words, in the whole history and flow of Buddhism. So, on a piece of paper here, which is rather difficult to see, I'm sorry about that, is uh, a sort of idea of what a Gohonzon looks like. So for those of you who have never seen a Gohonzon, remember it's on a piece of paper. The Gohonzons we have in our own home are probably about that length, though other Gohonzons that are in temples or community centers may be three or even five feet high. And on this Gohonzon, to the left and right of nam myoho renge kyo down the center, you have at the top there the names Shakyamuni and Taho. So there on the left is all the wisdom of the Buddha state represented. 
through that character for Shakyamuni. And on the right, through the Chinese character for Taho, is all the good fortune of the universe which can be drawn from outside you into your life. And all around those characters and around the words nam myoho renge down the center are many, many, many other Chinese characters. And as it says there, these are the characters which show, for example, the ten basic states of life, which we talked about in the first lecture, from hell at its worst to Buddhahood at its greatest. And also all the forces of the universe the forces that affect our lives, either adversely or advantageously, depending upon whether we are following a positive and wise course in life or not. So the sun is a great force of the universe, a great creator. The sun is on the Gohonsu. The moon, stars, and many other forces that are not so easy, easy to describe. You remember, as one example I gave you, the force that stops you on the edge of the pavement and prevents you from going further and a motorcycle passes you at 80 miles an hour and misses you by an inch. All these many and varied forces that work in order to protect our lives, provided we are moving in a positive direction, are depicted on the Gohonsan. There, too, are those four great bodhisattvas. The four great bodhisattvas which represent life force and purity, justice, and compassion, putting it very briefly. The qualities that are so great in human life and which we all contain. They're across the top. The other characters include not only light, brightness, but also darkness. Devadatta, the cousin of Shakyamuni Buddha, who tried to kill him on several occasions and constantly frustrated Shakyamuni's plans, is on the gongs. A female demon called Kishimojin who had ten daughters and a very devouring nature until she promised to work with the law and not against it, is also there. Daivadatta lives in every one of us. Every one of us has that devilish instinct inside of us. If we didn't have it, how could there be wars? Kishimojin also lives in us. Kishimojin, who rather than see her babies starve, fed them with other people's children. We all have such an instinct in us. Even though it's not in charge of us, it's there. Sometimes it can appear. That possessive, strongly possessive, jealous nature. So this Gonzan that we have is the most incredible thing. Every aspect of life, Every shade and color of it is represented by those Chinese characters. And of course, a Chinese character in itself is a whole story. This is why they're probably the most economical method of writing and conveying ideas that have ever, ever has existed in the history of the world. Each Chinese ideogram conveys so much that people could write a book on each one of them. So the Gohonzon, as Nichiren Daishonin said, described his life, his life as a human being. His life, which he was perfectly well aware, contained good and bad, darkness and light, shadows and brightness. He wanted to give an object of devotion to which everyone could relate. Whether at the moment they got down in front of it they were in the world of hell or anger 
or rapture. He didn't want to produce an object of devotion that someone would only find himself dying with shame to, in guilt and misery, asking for forgiveness. He wanted to produce an object of devotion which even though one might feel miserable and ashamed, you could practice to and realize that you were nothing unusual. That the devilish worlds and states that exist in oneself also exist in your neighbors and in everybody else around you. And most important of all, in the Buddha who is also a human being. But then, taking his brush and his sumi ink, he inscribed down the center of it all, in great bold characters, Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo Nichiren. Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo Nichiren. Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo, being the expression, as we discovered last week, of the Buddha state in words. All the incredible qualities of that state contained in the phrase nam myo ho renge kyo And to emphasize the point, he put Nichiren at the base of it. Nichiren, the human being. But Nichiren, who was also enlightened. So, of course, this is a very difficult thing to take in in a lecture like this, in a comparatively short time. I want to now, having described the Gohons in itself, even if only briefly, to explain to you a little bit about how it works. In Nichiren Buddhism, there are three practices. One is to perform gongyo, which is reciting the sutra, and chant nam myo ho renge kyo in front of the gohonsen. And the second practice is to teach others about Buddhism. And the third practice is to study. Study not in the sense of academic study, but to read the writings of Nichiren Daishonin and the explanations and guidance on those writings in order to understand the full spirit and meaning. So, through a combination of these three practices, one begins to understand more and more what Nichiren Daishonin's life was like you begin to understand his qualities, his courage, the breadth and depth and width and height of his wisdom, his incredible compassion, even against enemies who were hounding him throughout his life, and many other characteristics. And through this study and the picture you get of Nichiren Daishonin, so the characters on that Gohonzon, or if you like, the Gohonzon as a whole, begins to more and more live in your life. When you first look at the Gohonzon, you think, oh yes, it's rather beautiful. You know, it's a paper with all these beautiful Chinese characters on it. But as you go on practicing to it, day after day, month after month, year after year. So each of those characters begin to live in your life. Devadatta, the wicked cousin of Shakyamuni. And you begin to relate him to your life. You begin to understand what purity really means because you see it living in Nichiren Daishonin's life and actions. And furthermore, when you begin to teach others about Buddhism, what we call shakabuku, and when through that you're, as it were, compelled to get involved with another person's life, to feel their sufferings, to share them with them, to understand how their lives are made up, 
you also learn a great deal about your own life and you can relate those experiences to the teachings of Nichiren Daishonin which were all in the end aimed to help us to overcome those sufferings. So perhaps I'm beginning to make it clear that the more you look at the Gansan, the more you concentrate your mind on it, the more it begins to live. At the same time, of course, you're also becoming more and more perceptive about yourself. This is inevitable. Because as you look at this Gahonzan, you are seeing the qualities of life, and especially of life in the Buddha state. Therefore, it's a perfectly natural thing that you'll compare that with the state of life which you're in at the moment you're looking at that Gahonzan. Or the state of life that you're in day by day. And inevitably, therefore, you begin to see the gaps and differences between what is represented there on the Gahonsan and what is the actuality of your life today or tomorrow or the next day. And since the more you understand the Gahonsan, you, the more you admire the qualities which are contained on it, therefore, again, perfectly naturally, you will desire to develop those same qualities in your own life and thus close the gaps and differences between your state of life now and the state of life in the Buddha state which is on the Gahonsan. So this is an extraordinary thing and it's extremely difficult to understand. But the fact is that it works. Not one of us who practiced would go on practicing unless we constantly got actual proof that it works. So you may say, hold on a moment. I'm chanting nam myoho renge without a Gahonzan and I'm getting benefits. And that's perfectly right and reasonable. You might also say, therefore, why must I have a Gahonzan? If I'm getting benefits, isn't that good enough? But the answer to that is, yes, you do need a Gahonsan. Not because I'm saying so, but because the Buddha, in all his wisdom, said we need the Gahonsan. Because although it's true, through propelling your prayers, your determinations in your desires, out from your life, and also back into your life, through chanting nam myoho renge and through that activation of your Buddha state, combined with your prayers, the Buddha state in your environment will reflect itself and therefore benefit will begin to come to you. You can't actually make full use of those benefits unless you practice to the Gahonsan. And the reason for that is that you can't change your karma without the Gahonsan. So if you think back on all I've said so far, probably you can see the reason for that. As I said earlier, Nichiren Daishonin inscribed the Gahonzan and he called it Kanjin no Honzan, the object of devotion for observing one's life. It's only through seeing the gaps and differences between your state of life now and what you know more and more that Gohonzon represents, that you discover your unhappy karma. So, of course, some unhappy karma is very easy to see. You can see the surface of it. You may say, well, definitely, you know, my unhappy karma is debt. I'm always in debt. However much I spend, however much I earn, the bank account is always red. This is my karma. I've lived for 20, 30, 40 years and it's always been the same. And you're right, of course. But why are you always in debt? That's only the surface. What is the deep reason for being in debt? This is what you have to discover, don't you, if you're going to change it. So there's a 
marvelous person in Japan. His name is Mr. Izumi, and he's a vice president of the Lay Society there. And he's very down to earth in what he says. And one of his famous remarks in that respect is that if your baby has diarrhea, it's no good slapping a plaster on its bottom and thinking you're curing the disease. You've got to get to the root of it, haven't you? So you can moan and say, I've been married three times and they've always failed. And that's true and that's miserable. But what is the cause deep in your life? Getting married and divorcing three times. What is the cause for being in debt? What is the deep cause for being sick so much? What is the deep cause for always being so angry that you upset everybody wherever you go? What is the deep cause for finding it so difficult to come outwards and relate to people? The surface is easy, isn't it? But how do you get to the root of it? And the sad thing is, of course, the truth of the world is that people are slapping bits of plaster on babies' bottoms all over the place, figuratively speaking. So the purpose of this practice is to get to the root of it, to the root cause. And only you can understand that, of course, by getting at the depths of your life revealing what it is deep down there which is causing these surface problems to occur over and over and over again. Kanjin no Honsen, the object of devotion for observing your life. On the Gohonsen which you have is life in the Buddha state. By observing your own life you'll see the differences between the two the more you go on with that practice. And I'm sure you'll agree with me, once you know your enemy, i.e., what unhappy karma lies in your life, then you can set about overcoming that enemy and changing your life. And of course, Buddhism is so rounded that it gives you a practice which provides you with the strength to be able to do that. So the Gohonzon, as I hope you're now understanding, is vital to one's practice. To change one's karma so that you can reap to the full the good fortune of the benefits that come into your life. Otherwise, those benefits will be wasted. If you do an incredible amount of chanting and you get great benefit and all the things that you wanted happen and your family comes happy and everything that's no good if you're going to die tomorrow is it you have to change that unhappy aspect of the karma and live the whole of your natural lifespan in order to make full use of the benefit nam yo renge kyo is the law of the universe the creative force that produces all the myriad marvelous things that you can see around you. It's in the very nature of that law to require fullness of life. Life has a purpose from beginning to end. The purpose of that law is to create beautiful, wonderful things which will live a whole lifespan, which is the correct lifespan in the rhythm of that universe, in which to achieve the purpose of that particular phenomenon. And that includes a human being. Why should we be so arrogant as to think it doesn't? We have a natural lifespan which we should live. And not only live it, but live it to the full. Then every single one of us can achieve our true purpose in life. If we have our life shortened through accident or sickness, or even loneliness or sadness, we are failing to fulfill our purpose. In some way it's chopped off and the world becomes an unhappier place because of it. So probably it's now apparent to you 
that really speaking very generally, the Gohonzon has two functions mainly. One of its functions is to enable you to observe your life like a mirror. And the other function of the Gohonzon is to act as the link not only between the physical you that is speaking those words, nam myoho renge kyo and the unseen you that exists in your life, but also to act as the link between your life and its unseen state and the unseen state in life all around you. In other words, you physically chant nam myoho renge kyo to the gohonzon and you spiritually determined to take a great deal of action to change yourself and your circumstances. This reflects, of course, deep in your life and through the practice which activates the Buddha state, that then reflects itself out into your environment. So it's very easy, as I said last week, to see that an angry man reflects the state of his life to everybody in who, whom he contacts during a day. An angry man can make a whole office or a whole schoolroom miserable and perhaps even frightened. But though it's not so obvious, the man in the Buddha state or the woman in the Buddha state can do the same thing, reflecting the Buddha state in everybody. It's very difficult to see because it reveals itself in so many different ways that are very difficult to see or understand. It reveals itself perhaps in some sort of a radiance, in some sort of a wisdom in what the person says, in some sort of a kindness or an ability to listen or whatever. But in one way or another, that Buddha state and all its qualities will reflect itself into everything in the environment. So that is the second function of the Gahonsa. The first, to show you yourself so that you can change your karma. And the second, to act as the prime point, the focal point of your highest quality of life, which in its turn reflects itself into all of life that exists around you. So when Nichiren Daishonin was talking about the practice, he said words to the effect that the moment that you sit in front of the Gohonzon and chant nam myoho renge kyo you are in the Buddha state. It's very difficult to see or feel it or realize you may feel positively irritable sometimes when you sit down in front of the Gohonzon. The last thing on earth you want to do may be to chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. But the fact is that you couldn't even get yourself down sitting or kneeling in front of that Gohonzon and chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo unless you were in the Buddha state. Do so you remember last week I explained that those ten basic states of life each contain the ten basic states. If Buddha was here and hell was there and there was nothing joining those two, Buddha would be superhuman. But Buddha contains hell and hell contains Buddha. Buddha is a human being. So therefore, often you don't feel you're in the Buddha state. But gradually you realize through the practice that what Nichiren Daishonin said is true because you discover that you are getting glimpses of wisdom you never thought you possessed, of compassion you never believed you could release in certain circumstances, of courage that certainly wasn't there before, and so on and so on through the great qualities of the Buddha state. So you are in the Buddha state when you practice. And this is why the benefits come, reflecting back from your environment. So I'd like to read you one passage from Nichiren Daishonin's writings in which he talks about this matter. 
It's from a Gosho, which is called On Attaining Buddhahood. It is the same with a Buddha and a common mortal. While deluded, one is called a common mortal. But once enlightened, he is called a Buddha. Even a tarnished mirror will shine like a jewel if it is polished. A mind which presently is clouded by illusions originating from the innate darkness of life is like a tarnished mirror. But once it is polished, it will become clear, reflecting the enlightenment of immutable truth. Arouse deep faith and polish your mirror night and day. How should you polish it? Only by chanting Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo. So our practice to the gods and is polishing that mirror. Perhaps this is the most wonderful way of explaining it, isn't it? Far better than all I've, the words I've used this evening. But through polishing that mirror, through your practice, day in and day out, so you reveal the jewel which is in everybody's life, yet they know it not. And that is the Buddha state. This is the purpose of the gods, to act as a mirror. And of course, most important of all, the purpose of the gods that Nichiren Daishonin described is only to reveal the gods that exists in you. In other words, what Nichiren Daishonin inscribed has no power in itself. The power actually exists in you. In other words, it's not a magic charm. It's not something from outer space. It's something incredibly valuable, an unbelievable treasure. The fruits of the wisdom of all the Buddhas, which in its amazing way enables you to draw forth the Buddha state in your life through your effort. So of course to be able to inscribe a Gahonsen, you have, would have to be a Buddha. If those Chinese characters revealed anger or impatience or greed, that would reflect also in us. In that sense, the Gahonsen has power. But actually, it's drawing the power out of oneself. So in many, many Gosho, Nichiren Daishonin spoke most strictly about this point. If you believe the Gohonzon is anywhere outside of yourself, he said, you are not practicing this Buddhism. So of course this is quite a difficult concept to understand. But gradually, one's mind adjusts to it as you practice. And furthermore, you begin to see the results, so you know that really it is drawing something of a quality previously unimaginable out of your own life. So, the Kahonzen becomes in this way the prime point of your life. Every morning, every evening, sometimes more if you wish to, you feel more and more of a desire to come back to that prime point, to that absolute, constant, unchanging prime point. The only thing in this incredible world we live in, which is totally constant, totally unchanging, however long you look at it, for a whole lifetime. You bring yourself back to that. Furthermore, this can be developed onto a social scale. In our center we have a Gohonzon. So, 
all of us who are practicing, every so often, we go there and feel we want to just practice a bit to that gonzen. That is the prime point of our human efforts for the peace and happiness of this country. In Europe, in the south of France, we have a gonzen for the peace of Europe. The prime point for all the European members. Again, every so often, we go there. And perhaps together with people from Denmark and Scandinavia or France or Germany, we have the opportunity to practice to the prime point, which for us is, represents the future peace and happiness of Europe. The prime point, if you like, of unity, the unchanging constant reality of life, because what else is Buddhism preaching but the unbelievable treasure which is life itself, the dignity of life, the dignity of life which is represented on that gonzo. Life with its, all its amazing working. So just to conclude, I want to briefly mention a principle which is called in very simple words in Buddhism, ku, k and chu. Ku, K-U, K, K-E, and chu, C-H-U. Because I think this principle brings out very clearly the vital importance that the Gahonzan plays, not only in our, in our own lives, but also in the lives of the human family as a whole. So if you look at this world at the moment, you see an incredible amount of progress, which is unbelievably haphazard, isn't it? Everywhere you look, amazing things are being invented. People are shooting off, uh, you know, into space. Incredible technological advances are being made all around us. And it's so haphazard and so fast that it's really beginning to frighten more and more and more people. We wonder if we're really in control of all this. And when we think of nuclear missiles and all the rest of the paraphernalia of nuclear warfare, it makes us shiver even more. And we think of the one man who can press a button and start it all. And we say to ourselves, supposing, 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 he was crazy, a madman, Someone couldn't stop him, etc., etc., etc. So this is quite frightening to everybody. There isn't anyone really now who doesn't at times think, I believe, about this point. Very quickly they may hide their heads from it, but there are few people who don't recognize it. So this haphazard though you could say dynamic progress is arising out of the spirit of man K, K E, the physical aspect which you see manifested in all these technological advances but then on the other hand you have man's natural desire to want to harmonize with each other no one really wants war they may get swept away by emotion and get involved in war in no time at all, but they don't want it. In their hearts, they want harmony. In their hearts, they want to be able to get on with their daily lives, conducting their business or their teaching or whatever. In peace, this is the real desire. Even the most bloodthirsty revolutionary even the worst of terrorists, even the most maniacal of these extremists that exist in the world have some sort of great high ideal which they say they're working for, even though they may be undermining that ideal in the way they do it. Everyone desires peace and harmony. So this desire from deep in one's life is cool from the unseen part of the world, the unseen part of life. 
So there you have these two extraordinary phenomena. On the one side, a world going mad with technological and scientific advances, with absolutely no cohesion at all, with the risk of war or violence or conflicting effort every day. And on the other side, you have man and woman's innate desire for harmony and peace. And man and woman has always desired harmony. And they've never been able to achieve it. Not once in the whole of human history in a lasting and deep way. Why is this? What is missing? How can you have two extremes in this way arising out of a social or civilization created by human beings who are clever, unbelievably clever, you only have to look at their technological advances to see that. How can it be that they can be so crazy? This was what the Buddha observed, of course, in the world. So he didn't see that as it is now, but he knew what was coming. Shakyamuni Buddha 3,000 years ago said, this age of Mapo, which will begin 2,000 years after I die, will be an age of chaos and disaster in which there'll be a great unhappiness. Shakyamuni Buddha, like all the Buddhas, understood the workings of the law of cause and effect. He knew the potential in each human life for destruction. So we have this situation today and something is missing. And that thing I firmly believe with my whole life is what in fact is the link between all things unseen or spiritual and all things seen or physical, which is the law of life itself, which is nam myoho If you look at nature, you don't see this going on. You see amazing things occurring, fantastic natural advances in the way each myriad form of life grows and develops, what is more amazing than that? But yet, incredibly enough, this unbelievable myriad of life forms, of natural occurrences, works in harmony. It's only man with his own free will his own ability to think and judge, who is not working in that way. And this is because mankind does not understand that there is a link between those two aspects of life, ku and ke, the spiritual or the unseen part of life, and life's physical manifestation in all the myriad phenomena we see around us. And that linking point, which exists and which you can prove to exist in nature, is Chu. C-H-U. Chu is nam myoho kyo Chu is the Buddha state. The Buddha state which is vitally progressive and dynamic and yet at the same time totally harmonious. Chu is represented by the Gohonzon of nam myoho renge which Nichiren Daishonin inscribed. Therefore, if you bring your life back to the prime point of Chu regularly throughout one's life, day in, day out, then you will always come to the path of the middle way, the path of balance, the path that is in no sense a compromise. The path which is a path of dynamic advance with total harmony. This is what Chu is. This is what the Gahonzan of nam myoho kyo represents. This is what exists in every single human life, yet sadly, we can't see it and don't understand it. And this is what Nichiren Daishonin work to reveal by inscribing the Gohonson. Has anyone got a question sort of burning? 
Oh, I see. Yes, you mean I didn't mention it. No, thank you very much. Yes, sorry, that's the high priest's signature. The high priest who inscribes the Gohonson signs it to the left of the character Nichiren at the bottom. I'm so sorry. Can you, and you couldn't read it from back there, I guess. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Oh, I think that... I would say that's rather extreme. Uh, the involvement of nature is harmonious. Of course it's true that, that for various ages and various climates certain creatures exist. But the involvement of nature is such that those uh, evolutions are always keeping pace with the changes in the environment as a whole. So of course brontosauruses don't live today but brontosauruses couldn't in the very nature of things live today. So brontosauruses die, but they're replaced by something else. So there's a constant process of evolution going on, isn't there? Oh, that may be so. But I guess we've got a long way to go yet. And the most important point is we have a purpose in life. I mean, even a brontosaurus had a purpose. Even, you know, a small insect has a purpose in the, in the rhythm of the universe as a whole. Also, we, in our present form, have a purpose in life. Uh, maybe in billions of years to come, uh, this planet called Earth, like all physical things, will blow itself up and die. It's bound to come to an end, Buddhism would say. So whether human beings are still in their present form, all those billions and millions of years ahead, I can't guess. But what I'm sure of is that left to the normal nature of things, human beings will evolve and their replacements, if there are any replacements, will evolve in a similar way. So, for example, Buddhism doesn't, doesn't deny that life can exist similar to our own on many planets in the universe. The universe is boundless and endless. So, uh, what Buddhism would say is that wherever the, the uh, circumstances are similar to this earth, then by the law of cause and effect, a similar form of life must appear. So, it might not be quite the same sort of life as we know it. I mean, we might find that the people who were equivalent to us who lived on another planet due to slight variations in climate or other, other food and so on, you know, they may have ten toes in each foot instead of five. Or, you know, their eyes may be situated round here instead of here or something. But nevertheless, it would be similar. And especially the unseen state of their life, the spiritual side, would, would, would be working in a similar way. So I think nature evolves completely harmoniously. I mean, all, one of the earliest words in Buddhist teachings from Shakyamuni Buddha was, you know, everything is in flux. The whole universe is constantly changing. The only thing that doesn't change, Buddhism would say, is nam myoho renge But that change left to itself is harmonious. But man, due to his stupidity, the three poisons we call it, stupidity, anger, and greed. Man, due to those three poisons, causes poison, pollution, exhaustion of natural materials, and so on. Left to itself, I think nature is amazingly harmonious. No, that's right. Yes, but the point is we, we can, but we don't. That's the trouble with us. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Okay, well, it's just about nine o'clock, so we better close. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for listening, and uh, come again. <laughs> thank you.